Hello and welcome to Teaching Stream. Teaching Stream is our online teaching ministry here at Mount Lowbury Baptist Church and is used to provide the curriculum for our small groups. You are so welcome. This is Teaching Stream. Hi, I'm Sam and I'm the Minister at Melton Mowbray Baptist Church. This is episode four of the Countdown to the Cross. We're going to be looking at Wednesday. On Monday and Tuesday, uh, we have the teaching that goes place. We've missed out Tuesday because it's hard to pinpoint what that is and we've moved straight on to Wednesday. And today we're going to be looking at the anointing of Jesus at Bethany and we're going to be doing that from Mark's Gospel. If you haven't seen the previous episodes of this series, it might be worth going back to watch this series from the start. But if you have and you've been keeping up with us, then welcome. It's about time to turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 14, verse 1. You're going to read through till verse 11. But before you do that, let me pray. Loving Father God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that he accepted the hardest and longest week so that we might live in his place. Thank you that he went to death for our sins and then rose again victorious three days later that we might have life and life in all its fullness. As we turn to your word today, might we meet with you in your scripture and by your spirit. I pray that each of us would be changed by the experience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, it's time to pause the video and open up your Bibles to Mark 14 from chapter 1. Uh, Mark 14 from verse 1 all the way through to verse 11. So it's Wednesday in our reading. Uh, Jesus has been at the home of Lazarus. He has had the triumphal procession into Jerusalem. He has cleared the court of the Gentiles at the temple. He has taught in the temple. He's been back and forwards to Bethany. Uh, he's been teaching in the temple for Monday and Tuesday. And now we arrive at Wednesday. He is in the home of Simon the leper in the village of Bethany. But before that, we are told that the chief priests and the teachers of the law are scheming to arrest Jesus. So we have those who are in power, not wishing to relinquish that power, and they can see that Jesus is going to be a problem for them because he seems to be whipping up a riot among the people. If there is a riot among the people, then their Roman overlords might find somebody else who can manage the people better. Therefore, it is better to get rid of Jesus and to hold their position of power. But they are wise enough to know that if they are to do this too obviously, then the crowd who seem to think that he's a prophet and who are welcoming him with uh, palm branches may turn against them. So they're in the difficult place of having to please both the Roman overlords and the people who think that Jesus is a prophet. So they are conspiring together to make sure that they are able to kill Jesus but they want to do so without inspiring a riot. In the final two verses of the reading, in verse 10 and 11, we hear that Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 apostles, has, uh, has the idea to betray Jesus to the priests, and he does so for financial gain. He goes to them and he tells them that he is willing to tell them where they can find Jesus. And he looks for a time that it will be appropriate to betray him. This reading is a sandwich. It is a sandwich of uh, execution and betrayal with devotion in the centre. It's clear that the noose is tightening around Jesus. His time is running out. But where do we find him? Well, we find him where we usually find him. Eating a meal, reclining at a table with friends. And it is here that a woman comes in and smashes a alabaster jar to anoint Jesus with perfume that is made of pure nard. 
Now, nard is an extremely expensive perfume. It is expensive because the flower at the heart of it can only be bought in the Himalayas. Imagine transporting that kind of, uh, that kind of thing to make a perfume from the Himalayas to Judea in those days. It would have cost a fortune, and let me tell you, it did. Many women would store the entirety of their wealth within a bottle or a jar of this perfume. But what does this woman do as Jesus reclines at the table? She comes in, she breaks the dar, jar, and she pours it over Jesus. She breaks the jar, why? Because she intends to use all of it in blessing him. Nard is a fragrance that sticks around. It, it lasts on the clothes. It's a per, parfum rather than a perfume. And it is a rich aromatic smell. This woman comes and breaks the jar using the entirety of her inheritance and wealth to anoint Jesus. What is anointing? Well, anointing is where you put precious oil over someone. In the Old Testament, it usually points towards kingly or priestly person. Priests were anointed and kings were anointed. Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon king. What they're talking about there is him being placed with anointing. This takes place in uh, modern crowning ceremonies. We saw it at the coronation of King Charles. So in some ways she is pointing towards Jesus as king, but also towards Jesus as priests. The priests in the Old Testament were anointed as priests with special oil. So Jesus is anointed as both king, the Messiah, and priest, the one who will intercede on behalf of the people with the Father. These are two roles that Jesus will will fulfill uh, as he is glorified on the cross and, res and resurrected three days later. But the problem is, is that there's people in the room who see what happens. They look at what's going on and it says some of the disciples, some of the disciples have a problem with what she's done. They said, what on earth are you doing? We could have sold this perfume for a year's wages and given it to the poor. But Jesus says to them, you leave her alone. She has done a beautiful thing for me. The poor you will always have with you, but you can help them any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her what has taken place. The apostles, the disciples, they argue among themselves saying that this perfume should have been sold to give to the poor, but Jesus says, no, you will always have the poor to help. You won't always have me. What she has done in the moment is the perfect prophetic act. Now, one of the things I'd like to point out at this point is throughout the gospels, it's clear that there is a bias towards the poor. Throughout Jesus' teaching and the way that he behaves, he, he does wish to bring good news to the poor. However, this isn't the entirety of the good news. We must be careful not to place um, care for the poor at the centre of the gospel, because it isn't the centre of the gospel. The centre of the gospel is, of course, Jesus Christ himself. Helping the poor comes second to glorifying God and do, doing his will in the moment. It was clearly God's will that this woman would anoint Jesus. That was more important than selling it and giving it to the poor. Her worship was exuberant, it was embarrassing, but it also was costly. And that was deemed by Jesus to be a good thing. Now, this is partly because this is a once in a forever moment where the Messiah is about to be executed and then raised again. And as he is anointed with the nard and the way that that stays on his skin, it will accompany him through the crucifixion. As he is dying upon the cross, the worship of this woman will comfort Christ in his darkest moments. This is, of course, a great thing. 
And as he says, it prepares him for his burial. He's once again pointing out to the disciples, I am about to die. Of course, like usual, it seems to pass them by. So, yes, there is this bias to the poor, but the good news is good news to the poor. It is not simply the transformation of the poor's plight. And we as the church need to be careful that we don't place um, the transforming of the situation of those who are in poverty <coughs> as the gospel itself. One of the outworkings of the gospel should be good news to the poor. And we mustn't think that what I am saying here is that we shouldn't do, uh, we shouldn't be involved in mercy ministries to aid those who are in need. Of course we should. But we should also remember that actually doing the will of God in his timing trumps that. And sometimes what God calls us to do might not seem to be enacting that transformation of the situation of those who are in poverty. Just like this woman who breaks the alabaster jar, jar and anoints Jesus's body. So what's going on here? Well, either side of the sandwich, we have a group of men in the first two verses who are plotting to kill the Messiah. They don't know he is the Messiah, they just see him as a troublemaker. And so they have decided to retain their power and their wealth by killing Jesus. In the final two verses, we see Judas, who has decided to betray his friend. Why? For the sake of money. He is looking to gather wealth for himself. And in the middle, we find a woman, a woman who within the Jewish religious system of the time was seen less than men, was not allowed into the central parts of the temple. A woman has recognized the Messiah. She, rather than seeking to gain wealth, has lavishly poured out her wealth upon Jesus as an act of worship. This relates to a scene that took place not that long uh, before the widow's offering, which you can find in chapter 12, verse 41, where a old widow, he puts two very small meager coins into the offering. And Jesus says, she has given all that she has. And here in this, this vignette, what we have is a woman giving all that she has whilst a group of men seek to protect what they already have and the man seeks to earn money through betraying his friend. Jesus will head to the cross and this beautiful anointing gift of perfume will accompany him. Friends, let us be people who worship with exuberance in a costly manner and in ways that could embarrass ourselves. May we give God, give God the glory in Christ in all things and would our worship be a fragrance that accompanies Christ and brings him comfort and puts a smile on his face. Next week, we turn to the Last Supper. I look forward to working through that passage with you. God bless, and I'll see you next time.